and how uh, small schools are using it to blend their classrooms. And um, we'll also, if you're an online school, you'll be interested by a lot of the tools that we'll show here. So if that doesn't sound like it's interesting, then feel free to sneak out quickly and catch the one you really want to go to. Because um, apparently it's being recorded too, so you can just come back later and I'll talk to you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, question about that before going? Is it making a count? Yeah, so um, at the end of the session, I'll just let you guys play around and I'll walk around and answer any questions that you guys have, much like we do in our blended flip classrooms, and um, show you how we can. What site board is doing back on there? All right, nobody left. Even with the caveat, so we'll get started. Start so, if you want to save the world from an apocalyptic alien invasion, um, I highly recommend developing superpowers. And there's kind of two routes to superpowerdom. Um, the first route is. Uh, Kind of the, the powers route, and that's you either have to be born a mutant or have something happen to you, like getting bit by a mutant spider, or just be from another planet yourself, originally like Superman was. The second route, which is probably more possible for the rest of us, is become a multi-billionaire and create a supercomputer that can aid you on your uh, journeys to save the world, uh, much like Iron Man flying around with this Iron Man suit and having Jarvis talk in his ear and telling him what to do and stuff. So. That's my recommendations, and um, the reason why I say that is that I feel like as teachers right now, um, we're kind of expected in a sense to be superheroes um, and to have superpowers. Um, and it, the story we find ourselves in is not unlike um, a superhero story. The world's changing. We have devices invading the classroom. Um, apathy and distraction are real villains. There's shrinking budgets all around us. And ultimately, though, lives are at stake. So. Um, what we do every day in the classroom really matters in those students' lives. And so the stakes are high in what we're doing as teachers. And most of us are here because we had a superhero teacher. We find ourselves in education because we were inspired one time and we said, wait a minute, that person made a difference in my life. I want to do that for other people. <laughs> and so that's, that's the world we find ourselves in. We also find ourselves in a blended learning conference. And um, the key... Uh, uh, there's a key idea that is kind of arising out of blended learning um, that a lot of us discovered in the online world we could do as well. And it kind of has to do around time in the classroom. And so this is um, an idea that I'm stealing uh, absolutely point blank from uh, uh, Michael Horn and his work that he's done with blended schools and stuff. But uh, essentially in education so far, usually in the classroom, time is constant. We have so many hours with the students in the classroom, and we work through things, and when the unit's over, it's over, and we move on, and whatever mark you got, you got. And so we have this huge variation in competency on what we're trying to help uh, learners engage with, understand, and be able to master, um, but we have time the variable. But blended learning, the, one of the big bonuses, advantages, that has the potential to make time the variable, and we can make competency the constant, uh, which, is called, in kind of the circles out there, it's the idea of CBE, or competency-based um, education. And just want to talk briefly about what that looks like. So here's what, um, this graph represents uh, Johnny's marks. I'm going to pick on Johnny, poor Johnny. I may have to pick on Johnny last time. This, is, this represents Sally's marks. So uh, in, say, a pre-calc 30 class. So we have a few chapters here, and as you can see, um, same amount of time dedicated to each chapter, and then we move on. and. Poor Sally <laughs> um, struggled in the first unit transformations. And if you've um, ever dealt with pre-calculus 30, you know that that shows back up in function operations and rational logarithms and the dreaded uh, conics. Um, if that's in or out of the curriculum this year, will comes and goes. Um, the uh, this is going to this piece is going to keep showing up everywhere. And so if we move on from transformations without having that totally mastered and nailed down, um, that's a huge challenge for us. So. Uh, Sally struggled with that, and that's going to compound throughout the year. And even beyond just an individual course, uh, I found when I was teaching online and tutoring students one on one, they were never struggling with what the course was about. They were always struggling with something, some previous key piece of knowledge that they missed. And so, because they can't um, change the denominator of a fraction, 
that follows them through the rest of their lives and haunts them until they actually deal with that thing and fix it and move on. So here's, here's another situation, and same student, and here's another potential way that this could look. So now, on the time scale, I don't know if you can see this way at the back there, but uh, these bars are wider, and uh, some are wider, some are skinnier. And so transformations, um, we stuck with transformations longer for Sally because she needed that more time to, before she can have that breakthrough moment. Especially about math. The reason why I became a math teacher is I loved that moment when you're teaching math concepts and all of a sudden you get that, oh, now I get it. So math is all about that breakthrough moment um, where you, you, you hit a bump, you, you're, you're bumping up against the ceiling, bumping up against and then finally at some point you break through and I, the way I describe it to my students is like, I want you to have this, do you have it in your heart and soul? In the point where this math will never leave you. There's certain things that we just do so naturally we don't even think about anymore. Um, we can all add and we take that for granted because we can do that and just, it happens so naturally. It's something you don't even think about because it's it totally internalized and um, abstracted from anything we ever have to learn. We don't have to think about it anymore. Um, and that can happen with more and more complex topics in mathematics. They're so ingrained in you that you get it. You got to the point where, where it, it sinks in deep in your heart so you had that breakthrough moment. But if we move on before that breakthrough moment can happen because it's test day and now we're moving on, um, we can't do that. So competency-based education is often made possible by blended learning tools. And that's what we're gonna talk about uh, a bit today. So the cool thing about this is that we go on this unit until competency is reached and then we move on. So a certain level here. So you can see the competency is a lot more constant, but time becomes the variable. And there's all kinds of crazy challenges with that and things that we'll get in and talk about. But that's that um, has a lot of power. So that's what I'm gonna talk about here for a second. Now I'm just going to flip out of here for a second and flip over to a tool. Um, and StudyForge is just a tool. There's lots of digital curriculum out there. Um, and I'm just gonna talk about it briefly and show you what um, an experience might look like for a student. And so this is allowing a student to learn on their own, to take ownership of their own learning and to, and to dive into less on their own. I'll just play a couple minutes of a video here and talk briefly about what we've learned about video pedagogy over the past eight years. Spheres. The formula for the volume of a sphere is probably the most difficult to discover. The best way for us to think about the volume of a sphere is to take a sphere and explode it into a whole bunch of tiny pyramids whose peaks all meet at the center. This means they will all have the same perpendicular height, which is the radius of the sphere. So if we look at all these little pyramids and put them back together, then we get a sphere. This means that if we add up all of their volumes, then we get the volume of the sphere, which is what we're looking for. Mathematically, this is saying that the volume of the pyramid one plus the volume of pyramid two plus the volume of pyramid three, et cetera, et cetera, gives us the volume of the sphere. But we know that the volume of a pyramid is given by one third multiplied by the area of the base times the height, which in the case of all of our pyramids is r. So that means that the area of each of these smaller pyramids is the following. Notice that although each base has a different size, this is why we put the b1. So that you, you get the gist of what's going on here. So we have developed narrative videos that cover every learning outcome in Alberta from grade seven math all the way up through um, calculus, and uh, basically every stream as well. And so there's a couple things that you can do with an, an animated video that you can't do from a screen capture video or from uh, you know, a Khan Academy style video. And there's some things we've learned about video, video pedagogy that are really uh, crucial. I'll start playing another video as well and kind of demonstrate uh, what you're seeing here. But there's, well, I'll start this. There's a couple things you can see. So the pyramids flew out from here to here. So that's a piece that's actually really awesome in terms of learning math because everything's progressive and comes from somewhere else. So the volume of pyramid one flew from the volume of pyramid one and um, this one third when it gets factored out it flies out from here and comes over here. So you can see where things progress from diagram to um, uh, to into more abstract ways and so as you work through a video like this um, that helps a lot. The other thing that we've learned is that Students have short attention spans, <laughs> and so we watch students watch our videos. And if if there's longer than seven to ten seconds of nothing happening on screen, then the eyes start to wander. So what we realize is that we, um, as as we started to craft our videos, I'm just gonna... the volume 
play a little bit of another video here, is that you'll notice if, we, if you just kind of let our videos play, we never let longer than about seven seconds go by without highlighting or um, bringing the eye's attention to something. And what that means is that we're, you're always looking at what we're talking about auditorily because your eye is drawn to the movement, it's drawn to what's happening on screen. So that's another thing that we've learned to do um, that's really powerful with videos. So if you're ever out there creating your own videos, keep them as short as possible. <laughs> um, think about what you want them to be looking at and always be drawing their attention to that with movement. And then uh, you end up with something really sticky in terms of uh, being able to remember. The other thing that we do is that we never erase the screen. So you'll see if I go through here, as we kind of scrub through until full, the screen fills up. And I call it the whiteboard model of video as opposed to the PowerPoint model of video. So a lot of educational videos, you have something on the screen, and then it's gone. And then something else on the screen, and then it's gone. So you have a five minute video, but you've actually gone through, say, 20, 30 slides of content. And if you were to actually lay all that out <laughs> and stack it, you've gone through just a myriad of content in a very short amount of time, and it's only been on the screen for a short amount of time. So whereas with the whiteboard model, they can go back and review, they're seeing it grow, and this, this image is kind of getting burned into the back of their retinas, and it clicks. The other thing that allows us to do is um, every video has a note-taking supplement along with it. So, of course, that was the one image that we didn't put on here. So that's another thing that helps with video retention is that they're engaging with the video either by writing notes. Um, our videos often pause if they're, if they're long so that students have a chance to go back and reflect and look at things. And, and every video has this note-taking supplement as well, so they're filling in notes as they go. So um, a video can do some pretty powerful pedagogical things for explaining teaching math. But if you had a resource like this, then all of a sudden you have options because this is a little bit easier for students to learn from on their own than a textbook then reading. Um, uh, as you can see, there's like there's a lot of stuff going on here that helps a lot. And so uh, the other thing we have with StudyForge is as uh, with tons of video content, and then we have self-assessment practice. And so we call this a safe place for students to own their own learning. And so they come in here and they have a place to work um, if they want to work here. And so uh, there's a silver miniature soccer ball, so they can draw some diagrams on here. Um, if they have a touch screen, if they don't have a touch screen, they should just close that and they should be doing their math with pencil and paper. Um, if you don't have a touch screen, um, don't do math um, on the computer because typing out math is just terrific. It's getting better. There's some tools to get in and students can get um, fluent in that. So it, it it's, might be okay for some assessment, some summative type stuff, or for them to type out a math paper. Um, if you ever use Desmos graphing calculator, it's really easy to type math in there. So you can get used to that, but for doing practice, that's adding almost, even with a really good equation editor that responds to your key responses really quickly, it takes you twice as long to type it out than it does to draw it out and to, and to do your work like this. So something like um, even just writing pi r cubed, that's, I can do that in half a second, it's gonna take me a second to do that, and that's a huge loss. So anyways, just an argument for don't make your kids type that, please, um, <laughs> if they're doing any digital learning. Um, so, what, sorry, say that in um, When typing, for students who are doing math, and we tend to use um, our brains in a very specific way. In elementary, we learn to write with whatever hand we're told to write with. We switch to a digital environment, it's becoming left and right brain uh, operation as you cross over from hand to hand. Myself, I have a learning disability in reading and writing. I, can't type effectively uh, as well as I can write, or dictate, in the case of uh, a lot of what I do nowadays. So having my students work in StudyForge, if they haven't got a touch screen, I insist they do work on paper, because it's going against what they've learned in their brain wired from childhood. And while that's not a bad thing, but when we want to make fluidity of brain function, we want to get it done the way that we've been doing it, the way that our brains grew up doing it. Happy into the how the user brains. Getting it to type makes for a nice, clear example. They, they can type it up, it makes it easy to mark, but it doesn't go into the brain center. Okay. Our brains work as we grew them. We use our hands to do our things. We use our hands to do them. So this is a self-check resource. So if a student, um, uh, student will get to the end here and they'll check their they'll check their answer. So obviously I'm way off. 17 is not 452 centimeters, and that's because I'm not taking the time to get through this whole lesson. But um, the thing about StudyForge is that every question that warrants it has a step-by-step -step detailed solution. 
that will walk them through how to do that question as well. So that's available for them as well as they're working through. So this is a place of formative learning for the student where they're self-assessing. And that's the key thing is that is training um, our students to self-assess, to ask this question. So we ask them, this is the question we ask them, do you understand? Do you get this? Do you as a student understand? And they have to ask that question, do I understand this? So the goal is not did I get it right? The goal is do I understand what's going on? Yes, no, I'm not sure. So they say no. Um, this tracks as red for them. Their question now has some uh, green, some red. And as we work through this, um, they might use a detailed solution. They might still not understand. Um, but they're working through their questions here. So that's, um, that's this digital resource. Now what's different about this, and this is a little preview of what we'll show in a second here, is that as they're working in StudyForge, every single pen stroke that I do is saved at the time it was done, in the order it was done, to the database of the student's logs. So everything I'm doing on this screen is being monitored by StudyForge. So if I come to the back end of this question here, um, I can see what's green, what's red, but I, I, my work, if I'm using that workspace, is saved to the database here. But I know um, what I've been doing. I use, know when I use the drawing space. So StudyForge is just creating thousands of data points per student per hour as they're working through the curriculum. So uh, everything that they're doing in here is being watched. So we're going to come back to that in a second. Um, but for students, this green and this red, this is, again, safety for them to make mistakes is so important. So nothing ever in, in the study forge area is ever graded. So everything here is for their own self-check. So they should leave stuff right if they don't know it. That triggers you as a teacher to know, oh, there's some things that they're not going. It's, it's like a flag for them to come back. They can look at their red or yellow or green questions and know these are areas that I might still be struggling with. Um, so that's all just a resource for students to know where they're at. So, Imagine if you did have a resource like that, um, what that could look like. How could you use something like that? And so uh, I'm going to show kind of a progression of how you might start to move into a blended classroom. And so you can think of this as either roadmap, a roadmap of how to become a blended teacher using a resource like this, or you can think of this as different options to choose from as you go to a blended classroom. So you could not use the videos and just replace the textbook with a digital textbook on students' devices. And now it's something to add into the picture because study board is tracking what they're doing. And I'll show you why that's important in a couple minutes here. So you just do everything like they did before and they do some study board practice questions at home instead of practice questions from uh, another resource. And you might throw a video up in class if it's helpful um, uh, or have the students work through an interactive or something like that. Um, if you want to move a bit more blended, then you move to a pre-watch model where you tell some students, hey, Watch a couple of videos at home, then we'll come in and we'll still teach a, a lecture, but that gives, now students are coming into class with already some pre-learning. So you've selected some videos, um, you send them home to watch it, and they come to class and they're, they're already ahead of the game. And this one that I was like, yes, that's really a um, uh, way to just, to add um, an extra piece to uh, make your classroom time more effective. And then we could get really um, exciting is that if we got, our students comfortable in that and they're watching videos and they're doing that consistently, um, we could make that kind of the main line of defense for their learning and the teacher moves to the back of the room and here's where power really starts to happen because you move the practice from home into the classroom and this is the traditional benefit of a flip class model. This is what I'm doing this year with my grade nines is that they watch videos at home, they come with their questions, we start the class with quickly briefly going through, okay, what were the questions, what were things you guys did get from the videos and what's something that I just want to throw in and teach? What's a fun activity? What's something? So I, I'm now starting class knowing that my students have gotten um, some of the basics down and they're now working through um, their practice of way more time as a teacher in class to be helping them. And if you get comfortable with that, then you can get to a more individualized model. And this is just saying, um, and I've seen teachers do this and it blows my mind. Um, they said, okay, here's your iPads, here's your curriculum. Um, go learn and let me know when you need help. <laughs> and uh, uh, it blows my mind that I've seen people do this effectively and um, amazing. And so there's a, uh, somebody who was doing this in um, classroom in Saskatchewan. I went to go visit him and I was like, so what did you do? He said, well, um, I gave all my students advice. I said, here you go. This is what we're going to do this year. And they're like, really? He said, yeah, go learn. I'm here to help. Let me know how you're doing. And um, the test is in a couple weeks and we'll see how you guys do. And he said he used the same assessment he'd done the previous year with teaching from the front of the room 
um, with a more traditional model and without any kind of digital curriculum. He's the exact same test as the year before. And so I went to visit him later on in the year. I said, hey, how's it going? It's going, going well, it's work. He's like, oh man, it's amazing, it's awesome. Um, I gave all the same tests as last year and the marks didn't change at all. And I was like, is that, how, how is that a success? It sounds like, he said, I said, the marks didn't change, you're kind of in the same place as you were last year, and so what's the benefit? He said, well, the benefit is, I've had three kids finish early, I've had um, way more time to help out the kids who are behind and, and be on them. My time as a teacher has been freed up. We're doing all kinds of amazing projects. We're in the, doing stuff on the 3D printer. Um, we're here, the kids who finished early are now moving on to the next course, and I had some kids jump up, and this was a, this was um, a workplace stream, so math 10-3 course that he did this in. And the next, um, uh, so he had some students then, because they got through this really quickly, they're like, you know what, I could probably do the math 10-C, and so then they jumped back up to the math 10-C, which never would have happened before. So he's telling me about all these amazing stories that happened, and um, as far as he was concerned, um, <laughs> he was happy with the fact that I was still getting um, I was still getting my kids through. They're still achieving the same level of competency as before, and boom, we're having so much more um, time in the classroom. So that was a kind of cool story. And then this is the one that we're really getting um, into when we're talking about what's the benefit here for small schools? Well, oftentimes schools can't offer a lot of um, different programs or the different streams of math. But if you could, um, maybe teach to where you have the biggest cohort of kids, but um, you can't offer say a calculus at your school, or you can't offer um, the, the middle stream, the 10 dash, or the dash two stream, because you, can only, you only have enough resources to offer the three and the one. If you had a resource where you could be a support to a student learning on their own, and um, be there as the assessment, be there as the resource, be there as the support, and be there as the coach and the guy, then it really starts to open up a lot of options where um, schools can, uh, schools can offer options that they didn't have before, and with shrinking classes, they can still have a math specialist available to students who need it. So, what's the point of all this? Well, what's needed as you get from more traditional to more combined, like a crazy on the flip spectrum, is that on each of those scales, you're asking more and more of the student to take ownership of their own learning. So, them jumping in and being able to self-assess and to know, do I need help? <laughs> Um, what do I need help on, and what specifically have I tried and learned to get to the point where I can do that? So I saw a great acronym up in a teacher's class, and I use this now with my students. Um, she had S N O T written on the side of her whiteboard, and and so if her kids um, were asking for help, it's like, well, have you snotted yet? And I was like, what is this snot? Everyone's talking about snot in this classroom, and it was just a it was just a little reminder for the students that um, the order of where you should go to try and uh, make sure your understanding as you're self-assessing is self, neighbor, others, teacher. So first, check on yourself. If you exhausted every resource to try and get it on your own, because if you can figure it out on your own, you're closer to that breakthrough moment. Um, if someone teaches you um, and you learn something, you're way more likely to forget it than if you discover it on your own. So that's proven in all the research about inquiry learning, inquiry-based learning, all those kinds of things, is that if you can get to the point where you figured it out, now you've owned it. That's going to be self, then neighbor, ask your friend if he doesn't get it, then check with the broader class, and then if that's not there, then come check with your teacher. But um, that's just a way that she said, uh, try to advocate for greater student ownership in her class. But that's the key piece. Um, what I argue for and try to provide and try and help, and this is my passion, is that how then, if we're giving students all this ownership and all this freedom, how can we provide greater accountability to them in this to know um, which students need my help? Where do I interact and where do I um, get to them? Because I think as teachers, our superpower really is encouragement, is being a coach um, that can get there and that can um, help and, and come alongside and give some encouraging feedback. And so I'm going to talk about um, back in a, a demonstration here. Where did that go? What we do with all that data that we're tracking and uh, how that helps us as teachers in the classroom. Okay. So I promise um, I'm almost done blabbing, and then we'll uh, talk about yeah, there we go. Okay. So 
So this is like home base for any time I'm talking with a student or not talking with a student. So this is um, an aggregate summary <clears throat> of a student's work in, um, in a course. So anytime I'm talking with a student, I want to know how engaged is that student. Are they doing a little bit of practice? Are they doing a lot of practice? Have they even looked at any practice on this unit where they came and talked to me? So students say, hey, this week I'm really struggling with approximating um, <clears throat> my square roots. Well, that makes sense because you actually haven't done any learning on that yet. So why don't you do some learning, and then we'll come talk about that. So that instantly deflects a student who's lazy, so I can spend more time with a student who's not. With, so this logs look like this, and he's <laughs> still struggling with <clears throat> uh, the basics of exponent rules, then that's a student I need to reach out to because they've taken the effort to do it themselves. So right, right away, um, anytime I'm talking to a student, anytime I'm emailing a parent, <laughs> anytime I'm marking a test, this is always up beside because then I know um, gives me that extra information because as to how engaged they are. So this top bar is representing how much of the videos they watch. This bottom bar is representing their engagement with the practice questions. So yellow is if they clicked, I'm not sure if I understand. Red is if they clicked, I know I don't understand this. And so I can tell too, use this to tell which students I might need to reach out to. So that's an individual student, but I might use it on a specific lesson. Um, here's the students in my current <clears throat> Math 9 class, and they're supposed to be done this while I'm gone, so the sub didn't really do the work, but I'll have to get on them as I did that. Uh, <laughs> so here I can see which students might be struggling with questions. So, Or when they get to class, I've expected them to watch the videos, so I can see which ones haven't, and these ones are gonna, gonna relate with differently. Which students have been skipping through the videos? So um, Daniel here, I could drill down even a bit deeper and say, okay, which 21% of the videos has he watched? So this is something that I have open right before my class every day is how many students watch the videos, where are we at, and is there things that students are struggling with <clears throat> as well. I might also uh, I'll show that in a second. So I can see here, Daniel didn't watch video three and four and skipped over half of video one. Didn't finish video two, that's where he kind of checked out. So, um, which in this case, this one jumps out to an interactive. So went out to the interactive, was probably playing for it for a while and then didn't um, come back to that. Uh, I could also take a look at the. Let's see if this comes up. Slow. Oops. Let's go back to the whole class. I could also come here and see if there's any questions or videos that it seems like the whole class is struggling with as well. The other piece that study for just starting to do more and more of, and this is what I get really excited about, is that not just having teachers be, have the ability to drill through blocks, study for it itself combs through all of the data that is being generated and is looking for students that might need intervention that you might want to talk to. So this is a report of um, which students have been working over the past um, weekend and any students that might want to look at it and have a chat with. So I can see which students were working a lot, which students were hardly working, um, and I can drill down here and take a look at what they were working on. So I can see Wilbur work for a bit on this weekend, work for an hour and a half, and the red is video watching, the blue is question doing. So he watched videos, did some questions, which is awesome. Great pattern. Where Zach watched a stink load of videos, didn't do any practice, and so I'm really worried if he's not applying it, he's probably just cramming to get all his note package done because he maybe needed to hand it in the next day or something. And towards the end, you can see he's got some warnings here. So he started skipping through videos, probably because he was just trying to fill his note package. <laughs> so I know that in just a quick, brief check, because study board went through all those logs, gave me warnings of who I might want to talk to, and um, I can use that as a basis to have some conversations with my students. So um, I can also, from here, use this as kind of a home base to drill down and see, okay, so Isabel viewed the answer immediately and viewed the solution immediately on a bunch of different questions. So I can go here to click on her timeline, and see exactly what she did on that day, and see if that's something I want to talk about. Oh, and sure enough, she only did those four questions. And so if I look at her logs, um, StudyForge directed me to these logs with a little warning saying, hey, check out this student, and sure enough, she opened the solution, had the full detailed solution open in 11 seconds, and then it sat open the whole time she did her question. So even if they're not using that workspace, we still have all these great analytics as to how they're working through it. So even if you don't change anything else about your instruction and practice, Having them do practice on the computer and getting, these, getting this data back in there um, is super helpful. So back to the whole superhero analogy. When Iron Man's flying around in a suit, um, he has sensors 
all around him of what's going on around him, and his computer is looking all around and suggesting where the danger is. Oh, look out, there's an alien coming over here that's trying to missile at you, so fight that thing off. And oh no, there's someone falling off a building over there. And so it's letting him know where to look and where to watch, because um, he doesn't have the heightened spidey sense himself. Now Spider-Man, he's got the suit and the extra senses. And that's something we can talk about, but. <laughs> um, uh, and so as teachers, when, if we can take the computers that students have and have them not just be a content delivery tool, and not even just a content creation tool, which is oftentimes what we argue for, but if the computers, that, these devices that students have can be live sensors, um, that are informing us as to how they're working through the material, we as teachers can be way more aware and can let, let students have that greater degree of ownership and still feel as connected to them. Because I'll be honest, when I'm teaching a lecture, which I sometimes still do because I love to teach, that's why I became a teacher, and students love when I teach, they're always begging me to do that, and so <laughs> to some degree where it's effective, I still do that sometimes in the class. But I know when Daniel fell asleep because I saw him nod off and he went like this. Nobody falls asleep in my class ever, but <laughs> um, but I can tell I can kind of tell when they're engaged. But if they're on screens in the class or on screens in the learning commons or on screens out in other places, I don't have that kind of information. But if the computer can be um, grabbing that information from as they're going through, now I am back connected. I do know if they've fallen asleep as they're working through the material. So I have this extra capability, and that is actually a bit of a game changer. So it, it, it takes the blended learning model to a bit of a deeper level. So almost done. Um, Anthony uh, uses a safe word, but has been flipping way longer than he even discovered that. And so he's got a wealth of wisdom. So come talk to him. Um, but he's going to uh, just talk for a couple minutes about um, his experience as a small school <laughs> um, and why he's sticking with blended learning in that kind of context. So, all right. So, um, Study Corps just helped, and uh, as Richard says, I've been doing blended learning for quite some time, uh, flipped learning in particular. Uh, but the school that I work at is a K-9 school just outside of Calgary, and we have 200 students. And in the six years that I've been working there, I've seen our funding model get played with, so that we went from a fully staffed school uh, with full-out instruction for math, and I'm a math teacher for grades seven to nine. So when I first started doing it, I had an aide in my math class, I had kids pulled out to do uh, math programming to support those that were off curriculum. And in the six years that I've been there, the <coughs> load disappeared, the assistant time is cut. This year I have no assistant time, I have no pull out, it's just me. In order for me to deal with that scenario, uh, oh, not just me, I, I now have split classes, which I didn't know, uh, except for last year. So I have both seven and eight at the same time, or eight and nine at the same time. And this year I have half of the eights in all the nines, and then I have half of the eights again for the sevens. So yeah, it's <laughs> trying to deliver the same lesson twice the same way doesn't work. So what I found that works for me, and this is the way one of my classes will go. I'll come in, I'll set a problem with the bulk class. So let's say it's my nine eight, I'll put up a nine question. I can then circulate with my eights, or I can go get help my off curricular kids while my nines are working on that. The eights know they come in, they sit down, they start with the study board. They go to the next lesson they're currently working on. If they've completed the lessons to the benchmark I've asked, they're then working on a practice assignment to move it. So it auto corrects them. They can do 15 problems, auto correct. What did I get right? What did I get wrong? Go back, do it again. So they're all engaged at where they need to be, and I can still go help those kids that. Really, I've got two or three sitting there who are doing completely different math. I even had one girl who was doing grade three math in grade seven. Uh, you know, I'm having to make sure that all that happens at one time in my classroom. I've got 30 kids. I'm running four different curriculum, five different curriculum at one time. Study board is what helps me do that. So that when I get around the class, I come back up, I solve the problem on the board for the grade nines, highlight the key pieces of problem solving that they need to pull forward that they may not have gotten watching the videos, and then let them lose. If I have time available, I'll maybe do something for grade eight. I may not, because then the next grade eight comes in. And then I have grade seven, so I'll put a grade seven problem on the board. I'll get my, you know, off curricular kids working. I'll come back, I'll solve that problem, then I'll check and circulate and move the eight. It is a busy, busy class. What happens with my high-end kids, the ones that are just Eight through the study course lessons, they destroyed the math assignment. What I found them do is start going and sharing with each other. 
They have now become mentors to kids that need support, in class tutors, if you will. The class is just busy. It is going all the time with different levels of curriculum happening. Kids engaged with math, and it, it's, it has been my solution to a financial problem. Our school has had, you know, 210 to 220 kids for six years. Not a significant change in numbers. But when I started with pull out math and system time in every math class, till now where we're down a teacher and a half, we have no pull out time, no assistant support. That's what's happened. School school size hasn't changed. But we've lost, lost our band teacher, we've lost half our ELA, ELA teacher, and we've lost assistants. This is the only solution I have still deliver quality instruction to me, all the whole class. And that's the reality of living. Now I've got my grade nines, my grade eights, I've got two girls doing different grade eight outcome, grade seven outcome, whatever they need to be working on. Then I've got a girl from grade eight who's doing some stuff in grade seven. I've got my grade seven class, seven eight split. I've got my sevens, I've got my eights, and then I've got a seven who's on modifying, and I got a girl doing grade three, four. It is nothing for me to have to be supported in that program for any long time. And this is about the only way I found that I can make that happen to any degree of quality for each student. And they realize it and they embrace it and they work with it. And so we're um, we're just gonna hang out here. You have access to go kind of check in, so seeing which of you have kind of been in there. But you were all so attentive to this to me that you weren't creeping and playing around a study porch. So um, get in there and do that. And uh, yeah, no, I was actually like looking at you guys and seeing what you guys are up to. Um, <laughs> so have at her, take a look, and then let us know any questions you have or other things you want to see. Um, we'll just kind of leave the rest of the time open for you guys to drive, and we'll stop being the sage. Uh, on the stage and be the guy on the side, like we have to for with <laughs> the Awesome. I'll do it. Applause for, applause for the, the, the video recording. Thanks. We'd like to really thank the Thank you.